attention spans even differ among people. So tonight, I want to keep it short and to the point. It's going to be directed at our young people, at our graduates, but also um, we can take heed of some of the things that I want to share with you tonight. How will I ever make it in this world? And I'm sure that you could give me advice. I just want to give you a little bit of advice, and I want to encourage all of you, including the graduates, in the words that I say tonight. You know and I know that everybody's trying to make it in this world. Some people have said it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. People will do, in other words, anything to gain success. An athlete will take steroids or cork a bat. And then the big thing is, you know, did they really do it on purpose? Did they know? And there's a big, long court trial and whatsoever. Yeah, they, they knew. They knew they were trying to get ahead. There was so much competition that they felt they had to get an edge in some way. That's in professional sports, but that, that bleeds on down into our everyday life. It's part of our culture. Someone will try to gain some uh, insider information so that they can make the best investments and get ahead financially, sometimes with a huge windfall, even though they're doing it illegally. They will try anything. Sometimes people will falsify information on a resume just to get a better job. And they do all of this in hopes to be able to make it in this world, to make what we call a better life for themselves, or to live up to the American dream, or whatever it is that you want to call it. This stuff, obviously, though, only carries with it the appearance of true success. And that appearance of true success, because it's not real success, is limited in time. It doesn't last forever. And when folks come down to the end of their lives and they reckon what their lives have been all about, they must confess that if they haven't lived an honorable life in pursuit of the right things, that most everything that they've done really comes down to very little. The only thing that matters is how we treat our families, our relationship with the Lord. Those are two of the things that are the most important in our lives. And when people lie, cheat, and steal simply to get ahead, to think that they're going to make it in the world, it ends up deceiving them and deceiving everyone around them. And it brings them oftentimes to nothing and feelings of emptiness. It doesn't appear that way. We feel like we've made it over. Ah, yeah, we, we got by on that one. Boy, we just, you know, we fudged a little bit on that and we were able to make it. How dishonest. And if you start out, gentlemen, that way, fudging a little bit here and a little bit there, being a little bit dishonest just to try to make it, it just opens the door for a greater opportunity to continue that in your life. And it's a never-ending cycle. And sometimes you simply find yourself unable to be able to break free from it. So you ask, how do you make it uh, in this difficult world? Well, the Bible gives us some guidelines. Tonight, I just want to mention three, and it'll serve as my outline. Number one, face your fears. Face your fears. Number two, forget your failures. And number three, follow your faith. Face your fears, forget your failures, and follow your faith. So let's begin with facing your fears. Now, we all get afraid sometimes. That's no secret. We've all been there. Your heart begins to beat rapidly. There's a shortness of breath. You have difficulty swallowing. Your knees get weak. Your hands get cold, but you get hot all over. You know what that describes? That describes a physiological uh, phenomenon that occurs when somebody has to make, oftentimes, their very first public speech. And then their brain freezes. They have no clue what to say sometimes when they get in front of people. Why? That's fear. Because fear will immobilize you. It will paralyze you. Do you know the number one fear really is public speaking? To get up in front of people? That's the number one fear. And to speak. And if you think about it in your own lives, think how that fear paralyzes you. It keeps you from saying and doing the things that you want to say and do or the things that you've prepared to say and do. One of the greatest hazards to success then is fear. Not all fear is bad. As a matter of fact, 
Sometimes fear is good because it'll actually motivate us. What's wrong about fear or what's wrong about our relationship with fear, with fear is that so oftentimes we allow fear to control our lives. It'll paralyze us and keep us from achieving our goals. And we'll spend a lot of time second-guessing ourselves. If you ever run into somebody that just has this incredible um, bent towards being fearful about everything, and you think in your heart how sad, but I would suggest that if we examine our own lives, there are many things that we're afraid of, and oftentimes it holds us back from achieving everything that God would have for us or any goal that we would have or set in our own lives. Let me illustrate this um, with this university test or survey that was given a while back. And in this survey, um, this university set up a situation where um, they tested kids from grade school all the way to high school. What they did was they gave uh, a card with three lines on the card, or they, they pictured a card with three lines on it. And the object was to identify the longest line on the card in these classes of kids. Now, they did it in groups of ten. And what happened was is that nine out of the ten kids were instructed when they were to choose the longest line, that they were supposed to choose the second longest line, not the first longest line. One student in each of the groups of ten then was left in the dark. They were naturally going to choose the longest line when the moderator asked which is the longest line on the card, right? Isn't that what you would do? When the moderator pointed to the longest line, only that one kid raised his hand 75% of the time. You know what happened? When the teacher pointed to the second longest line or the moderator pointed to the second longest line, the nine kids raised their hand, and so did the tenth kid. Why? Fear. Fear of being wrong. Fear of being, you know, different. Fear of not being accepted. Fear of something drove them to know, to go against what they knew to be true. That's the longest line. But when they looked around, they were willing to choose even what defied, you know, reality. They chose the second longest line because everybody else did because they were afraid. I think it's interesting just to throw in another little illustration there. I've seen this actually demonstrated um, on video where you have a situation where somebody is, um, it's, a, it's a mock, it's not a real deal, but you have somebody walking down the street and you have, say, someone getting attacked by an assailant, a supposed assailant. Maybe they steal their purse. Do you know that everyone will stand around and watch as the assailant makes away with the purse unless they see somebody else respond? They'll simply sit there and watch as that person gets away because they can't believe what they've seen and they're afraid to respond to it. So they have to wait for confirmation from someone else. Why? Because of fear. In our society and in our own psyche is built in this idea that we have to be approved, acknowledged, and if we're not, perhaps sometimes we're afraid to step out. But I would submit to you that God has already put His approval on you and if he's called you and required you and gifted you to do something, there is absolutely no reason why you should be afraid to do that. Now, how can we overcome this idea of fear, negative fear, in our lives? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 holds the answer. It says this, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, that is fearful or cowardly. The spirit that God gave us doesn't make us fearful or cowardly, but gives us power, the power to love and the power of self-discipline. It's the controlling factor in our lives, the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't make us afraid. Paul writes this to encourage a young pastor named Timothy 
who was probably in his 30s, and he's pastoring a very large church, meeting in homes, and he feels insufficient. He doesn't feel like he's up to the task. There's no way that I can possibly do this. And Paul says, listen, you're acting like a coward. Stop it. You don't have to because the spirit that God gave you is one of power and one of love and one of self-discipline. You can face the challenges of life no matter how fearful because the Spirit of God is the one that empowers you in the first place. As soon as you begin to think that you're doing it on your own, you're going to fall flat on your face, I guarantee it. You can fight with all your might, and when it comes down to it, you'll lose. It's only by the power of God that you can overcome your fears. Look at all the tough guys in the world. And you think that they're not afraid of anything until you get to know them. And you realize that they're afraid of a whole lot. As a matter of fact, maybe they're tough guys because they are afraid. When you know just a little bit about how people work, and when you've lived for just a little while, you begin to see those kind of things. And you begin to be able to strip away the layers of a person's personality. And when you get down to the center of it, you know what you find oftentimes? You find fear. Fear of failure, fear of not being able to get ahead, fear of not being able to provide for my family. And it's at that point that God says, through his word, through Paul to Timothy, listen, God didn't give you that spirit of fear. God's going to enable you. He'll be with you. He'll help you. He's the one that gives you the victory. Therefore, you don't have to fear. Fears will indeed be with you for all of your life. And I think what this passage teaches us is that you don't have to run from them. You can face them if the Spirit of God is operational in your life. You have to not be afraid to look society in the face and say, that's wrong and I won't participate. You can't be afraid to say, I believe that there's objective truth, not just subjective truth. How would you even know that there's subjective truth if there weren't objective truth. Stop and think about that for a second. If there wasn't a, a truth that existed apart from your own opinion, how would you even know that you had an opinion? See, it's not whatever works for me, because I think murder may work for me. But is that right? No, that's wrong. Oh, it's okay to cheat a little bit on a test because that's going to help me to get a better grade. I've determined that for myself. So that's truth for me. That's not truth as far as the teacher is concerned. And if the teacher catches you, you know the penalty. Why? Because the teacher is the law. And in life, God is the law. And there's an objective truth that should steer everything that we do. There's an ethical truth. And so what we need to do is we need to face our fear by doing the right thing, by not cheating on the job, by not cheating on a test, by not cheating our, our neighbor, but by doing the right thing. Often fear motivates us to do things like that. And the sad thing is, is that it's so deceitful that we don't even recognize that that's what our motivation is. But if you have the Spirit of God, you have the power to overcome that. You can face your fears. Next, forget your failures. If you want to make it in this world, you simply have to forget your failures. Now, I wish that I had a better understanding and acceptance of failure myself. Uh, when we hear the word failure it immediately brings to our mind a negative connotation. Uh, as a society, we hate failure. We think that that's not acceptable. And oftentimes, we run into people who live in a constant state of failure. They don't feel as though they can do anything because they've tried something and failed at it. So they say, I'm not even going to try because I already know that I'm going to fail. I've given up. But you know, the truth is, everyone fails multiple times in their life. Let me offer you four quotes from some notable people that you know or have heard about. 
concerning failure and success. Thomas Edison said this when he was trying to develop the light bulb. I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. That's all. Do you see the, the perspective? Forget your failure. Winston Churchill said this, Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Don't give up. Another person said, there is only one thing that makes a dream impossible to achieve. The fear of failure. And then Truman Capote said this, Failure, and this is my favorite one, Failure is a condiment that gives success flavor. Failure is the condiment that gives success flavor. Let me illustrate this in a pastoral setting from a pastor's perspective. Because oftentimes, you know, we feel like we're a failure because things don't always turn out like we plan. So we fall into the same trap as everyone else. We're just people. You know, everyone in my family knows me, you know, better than you know me. And, and I'm just a person, just like you're a person. And you know that as well. I hope I communicate that to you very plainly. I, uh, I read that one pastor said this. Uh, I was reading a book by a very successful, he defined it apparently, a very successful pastor. The church had grown from 10 to 15,000. When I saw the book, I was thinking, this guy knows what to do. He's not a failure, and I'll learn a lot about success from his book. So, this pastor says, I start reading the introduction. One of the first things that came out loud and clear was this. I, this is a quote from the book, I would have a lot easier time writing a book about how not to do things than I would writing a book on how to do things right. He said that, because he'd experienced more failures than success. He simply didn't give up. Failures are not the end of the world. As a matter of fact, they're the beginning of success. Failures are the beginning of success if you don't give up. What does this mean, essentially, for our lives? If we were to look at Philippians Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, I want us to notice what Paul says concerning his own failure, again, as he's encouraging the church at Philippi. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, he says this, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul makes two implications in this passage. Number one, he refuses to allow failures to become destructive in his life. He says, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But this one thing I do, I forget what is behind and I strain towards what is ahead. Number two, he refuses to allow failures to beset his journey toward his goal. No, he's going to press on towards what is ahead. As a matter of fact, verse 14 says that. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In life, you will fail. There will be failures. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And what really counts is is what you do with those failures. You can't quit. You simply have to press on. Leave it in the past and move forward. Paul obviously had many failures in his own life. All these years later, thanks to preachers and whatnot, we think Paul was this super guy that maybe never did anything wrong. But Paul had big problems. I mean, he persecuted the church. Do you realize that he had to live with the memory of the fact that he superintended 
the beatings and scourgings and even death of Christians, even the first martyr, Stephen, who died for having faith in Christ in the book of Acts, we see that Paul was there and he was holding the coats of the men who were stoning Stephen. Paul had to live with that memory in his own life. In another place in the book of Romans, in chapter 7, he's talking about the sin that we all struggle with. He says, once I was alive, then the law came, sin died, and I revived. In other words, there was one time when I was a kid. I didn't really recognize everything there was about being obedient to God. But then once I became aware of the law, it gave life to sin. Why? Because it pointed it out. It's like a sign that says, don't do this. And you know what that makes us do as human beings? Want to do that. Take a look at your own self. Take a look at your children if you can't see it in yourself anymore. I'd say examine yourself if you can't see it. As soon as someone says you can't do it, that makes you want to do it. You won't take their word for it. Paul says, listen, if I didn't know what coveting was, I wouldn't even know that I was doing it wrong or that I was coveting and, and doing something wrong in God's sight. But since the law pointed it out, I realized it. And sin revived and I died in my own life. And perhaps, other than Jesus, there's almost no person alive that ever lived with a more acute sense of self-sin than Paul. And yet, he's the same person that said, Listen, I'm going to forget what's behind all my failures and every way that I've gone wrong in the sight of God, and I'm going to press forward toward the calling, that thing that God has called me to, to spread the gospel, to start churches, to superintend churches, to know Jesus, not only in, in the fellowship of His suffering, but in the power of His resurrection. That's what I'm all about now. Why? Because I've forgotten how my failures could beset me, and I'm pressing on towards the mark that God has called me to. Because we all fail, don't feel like you're the only one. Press on. You don't have to be a failure. Listen, life presents you with lots of opportunities, and you're going to fail at some of them. Don't give up. Press on if you want to succeed. Winston Churchill, which the more quotes I read of Winston Churchill, the better I like this guy. Um, I know that, you know, he had his issues, but he made some awesome quotes, and he spoke with such authority. As the story goes, he was asked to give the commencement speech at Oxford University in the middle of World War II. And so he shows up at the event, he gets up to the podium, and he begins his speech. And he says these three words, never give up. And then he pauses for a few seconds. And then he says, never give up. He packs up his stuff, walks away, his speech is done. His whole message to the graduates at Oxford during World War II is never give up. And times were hard in Europe and in England at that time. And so his best advice to the brightest minds in the land was never give up give up. If you focus on your failures, I guarantee you, you will give up. Forget your failures and move on with life if you want to make it in this world. And then finally, follow your faith. Follow your faith. If you're going to run a race, you're going to want to know where the finish line is, right? Anybody in here ever run a race? Yeah, you want to know how far it is that you have to go. The course is not as important as the finish line. Now, I've run in a 5K race before, so I trained for that 5K race. I didn't know exactly what the course would look like before I ran it for the first time, but uh, I wanted to know where the finish line was, and I trained my body so that it would be prepared to reach the finish line with strength so that I could have that little extra kick at the end. I'm not saying I'm a great runner. Do I look like I have a runner's body to you? No. My legs are only about that long. Do you know how many times those things have to motor around to go a little over 3.1 miles? A long, long way. I was running with uh, Logan, my grandson, the other day around the block, and you know, he just got out of third grade. He just graduated third grade himself, and so he's been running with me from time to time since he was in first grade, he says. 
I think second, but he says first. He's probably right. And uh, so we were trucking. I'd run a couple of miles, and we were running around the block, and boy, we were moving on. And he said, hey, Grandpa, this is our fourth grade run, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is, man. You're, you're doing well. And I mean, we were, we were hauling it. We were moving around pretty good. He was training for the future. Of course, he said, the caps around my knees are hurting a little bit, though, Grandpa. <laughs> I said, yeah, you're running on the sidewalk. No, I, did. I didn't comment on that. We just kept on pressing on. We knew that it wasn't going to be too long. We were going to see the house, and we would be done running around the block. Because that focal point, that finish line, is so important in our lives. Again, let me illustrate the idea of following your faith by dealing with a focal point. On day six of the ill-fated mission of Apollo 13, the astronauts needed to make a critical course correction, but they had to shut down their onboard computer that steered their craft so that they could conserve energy. If they failed, they might never be able to return to Earth. The possibility of them making it was slim. They had no instrumentation to tell them which direction to go. And so, as the 1995 movie shows, astronaut Jim uh, Lovell found his reference point, and it was Earth. He stared out the window, a tiny window in that spacecraft, for 39 seconds. All he did as they fired that main engine, as they burned that main engine, to try to get them back on course, steering the craft manually, was focus on Earth. If you know anything about travel and reentry, it has to be at the right angle, at the right time. For 39 seconds, he stayed focused on Earth. And the wonderful thing about it is they made it because he stayed focused. They had no idea how they were going to do it. The only thing they knew was we need to stay focused on a reference point. That way, we can follow the course that we need to be on so that we can achieve our objective at the end. What's our reference point? We can take that from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this is right after chapter 11, obviously this is chapter 12, and chapter 11 deals with the heroes of the faith from the Old and Intertestamental periods. So what the writer is saying here is, all of these people that I've just mentioned, their lives stand witness that you can make it. We're surrounded like in a coliseum. Not that they're watching from heaven because there's no evidence in all of Scripture that heaven watches that as we do things here on earth, but rather their lives stand as a testimony, their lives of faith stand as a testimony, and it's, they stand around us as in a coliseum testifying that you can make it too. And so he says, let us then throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us never give up. But run the race. How do we do that? We fix our eyes on Jesus. He is, I love this translation, He is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He started it all, and He'll get us to our destination if we'll keep our eyes focused on Him. Listen, He ran that same race, and it says, For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 says, Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus is our reference point. If Jesus did it, so can you. The writer here of Hebrews is addressing a crowd that's really struggling with their faith. And they're losing their focus because things aren't turning out like they thought they would. They're basically a group of Jewish Christians that are spread out in the Roman Empire. They've come under uh, that influence and persecution is beginning to escalate. As a matter of fact, Nero has burned Rome and blamed it on the Christians. 
Jewish people don't want to have anything to do with these now Jewish Christians. So they're being ostracized in the marketplace and they can't provide for their families. They don't know how they're going to make it. And their temptation is to leave faith in Christ and go back to their former lifestyle. Why? Because they've lost their focus. They, they began to lose that reference point of Jesus in their life. And knowing, in losing that reference point, knowing that he could guide them ultimately to their destination. And so the author writes, using that sports analogy of a race and witnesses in a coliseum, standing testimony. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. Just establish your reference point. Just like every runner needs a reference point, so we as Christians need a reference point. And that reference point is Jesus, if we want to finish the race. If we want to really make it in this world, Jesus is our only reference point. Everything else is on the periphery. One day, nothing else will matter except Jesus. So let's fix our eyes on him. He's our reference point. He's our true north. If you ever get lost, how important is knowing what north is? You can get to where you need to be if you can only know where north is. Jesus is our north. All we need to do is know him. He can get us there. If we look at other things, no doubt we'll get off course. We'll forget about our reference point. We won't make it because we'll be chasing the wrong dream. We'll be following the wrong lifestyle because we haven't made Jesus our focal point. Our faith is what we'll follow. We can't say we follow Jesus and follow money or power or recognition or satisfaction or a placid life of peace without any interruption, <laughs> I don't know if there's a life like that apart from heaven, and you'll never gain it simply trying to pursue those things. The only way in life that any of us can ever make it <coughs> is to follow our faith, a faith in Jesus that's pure and unadulterated because He's the one that's already crossed the finish line. He's the one that knows the way. He's the one that has the power to help us to get there. So we can't lose focus of Jesus. We can't get distracted. We simply need to focus on Him. So let me say this in conclusion. I want us all to make it in this world. I want us all to be a, su a success. Let's let God define that success for us. In order to do that, we have to face our fears, forget our failures, and follow our faith. It's that simple. It's not some, you know, make $100,000 working at home, kind of get rich quick thing. Life is hard. Life is tough. There's no way around that. But God is the answer. God is our help. If we'll only face our fears and let Him help us. If we'll only forget our failures because He'll over help us to overcome them. And if we'll follow Him because our eyes are fixed on Him, we'll be okay. We'll make it in this world if we'll simply do those three things. I think we'll find that everything else will fall in place. Stand with me if you would. Now, as I promised, it was going to be short, and it was short tonight. But I don't want you to forget those three things. And if you do, I'm not going to recap them again because I want you to go on YouTube in the next couple days, and watch the video. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the graduates, and I thank you for everyone that made it out tonight. Lord, may the words that were shared tonight penetrate our hearts, every one of us. Help us never to forget them, but always allow them to be what guides us in our life so that the success that we find can be a success that you've defined for us. Lord, that's too much pressure to think that we have to make it in this world because we can't do it. And we can't spend our whole lives doing that. There's just not enough time in the day. So, Lord, tonight we surrender our hearts to you. We surrender our fe fears, our failures, 
And we focus on you with all the faith that we can muster. And we ask for your help so that we can not only make it in this world, but so that we can make it in the world to come. Lord, we don't take the credit for anything. We give it all to you because you do it all for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And let's go back and have some subs and all the open house fixings and some cake. God bless you guys, and I'll see you in the back.